probably the first time I've actually properly spoken about it. The implications of like actually being an influencer. So at 20, that was just tenfold for me. No number is ever enough. So I ended up actually just hitting, I think it was maybe beginning of 2020 when I was starting my company and I just decided I don't want to do this. What do you think was the hardest part of launching a business at 21 years old? It had to have been not really knowing what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. I just want to clear my head. There's so many people around business owners, that's your parents, your siblings, like your friends, your partners and whatnot. The more pressure I'm under, the more pressure they're under to kind of like just be my mate. For me, going and taking the step to therapy is just genuinely so that I can actually like free up space when I'm with these people. We have a really powerful in-house solution that we've created in UGC, which is that we have six girls that work in the office and we have a content space. So now it went from a client having to pay 40 different creators for 40 videos to hiring Just Be Seen and getting six to seven content creators all doing amazing approved concepts, getting them edited and then actually uploaded for them too in an approval process. Just quickly before we get started, guys, if you've been enjoying the podcast, can I please ask that you consider leaving a five-star review and subscribing on whatever platform you've been listening. It really helps the podcast grow. All right, now that everyone's caught up, we found out that there's a lot of different weird backstories going back so to the childhood weird. of everyone knowing each other. Um, and another thing I realized is I never say like, welcome back to Life, Money and Love. So if you listen to a first episode, I never say the name of the podcast, but welcome back to Life, Money and Love. I feel like I've never done that before in the whole time. Um, but we got Lexi Murray today. Hello. She's had um, her massive commute from the other side of Alexandria over to our office. So thanks for coming in. Um, so we're going to get into a lot of your backstory as you're asking. You don't know what to expect, but it's just no about idea. you. You're the founder of BC and Socials. Um, you launched the business, the agency at the ripe old age of 21 years old. Uh, and over the last like three, four years, you've taken it from the spare bedroom, like so many people do, to uh, an amazing, like fully set up creative uh, studio with an office in there and a, and a, and a team of full time staff. So I'm interested in that journey mm -hmm. and how you navigated all that, tried to learn everything as you go as such a young entrepreneur. But before we get into the business stuff, what I like to do a lot of the time is kind of get to know the people before and how you became this person. Sure. Um, but for you, like, it's always a different answer when I, when I ask people this question, but through like your childhood, what did you want to be? Like, what were your dreams as a, as a kid? Did you know you wanted to start a mm. business? What was little Lexi dreaming about? Okay. So you've <clears> done <throat> some good back research, which I is have. absolutely epic. So it's actually interesting though, because like a lot of people, they say, you know, I started with like a lemonade stand and <laughs> stuff. I just don't really remember much of my childhood. Mm. So when I first, so I grew up in England until I was about 11 or 12 and then moved to Australia, which actually in itself was like quite a big thing for me in that time. So for me, I didn't really feel I fully knew what business or what business really was until probably maybe like year 11 and 12. Mm. I didn't actually do business in high school or primary school or anything like that. So I didn't have much. Do you want me to no, oh, I'm not going to do you something. For anyone listening, there's just the longest horn beat oh, yeah, right I was outside like, the is studio. that going to interfere? No, no, Sorry it, doesn't, it doesn't pick up the super direction. But oh, anyway, that's yeah. good. Anyway, yeah, so I pretty much didn't really hear what business was <clears> until maybe eleven, year 11 and 12. And then I kind of, my dad was always an entrepreneur mm. and he was in the business world. So he kind of, he's probably been my biggest influence and then went to uni. So kind of did like the stock standard, like college experience, yeah. went to I did business in uni, didn't do it in high school, which upon reflection now means nothing. So I'm really glad, yeah. which I think is really interesting because then in year 12 and 11 and whatnot, they put so much pressure on you mm. to know what you're going to do at uni and everything from the subjects you do. But I think I did like legal, which is still relevant, but then like HPE, which is yeah. just not relevant <laughs> to me. And then maybe something I can't even think. But yeah, so I guess for me, I didn't have one of those like lemonade stand memories of entrepreneurship. Mine was just kind of being a normal kid. And then when it got to year 11 and 12, decided to pick up a business management course, I think at UQ, which is in Queensland. While you were still in school? No, no, no. Oh, after, well, school. after school. Okay, I'm yeah, not yeah. that good. <clears throat> I was just a pretty average kid. And then when I finished school was like, okay, I'm going to go to uni. I did the whole campus thing. So yeah. I don't think that, I don't know if they have it in Sydney, but in Queensland, College is a big thing. So you go if you're from, because I'm from Noosa, so I would go and stay on campus yeah, at yeah. this place called College, Women's College, and it's chaos. It's kind of like the Australian sorority and you go and live there and you live in halls and you share a bathroom and you have a single bed. 
So that was Love kind it. of how it all started. And that's when I was getting into social media. Mm. So at the time I finished school 2015 or 16 and that's when Instagram like really started. Yeah, for and sure. And that was when people were becoming like little micro influencers. And I guess that's where my career kind of like really took off, which is ironic. Because yeah. Because you were like, like we were just saying, um, chatting before we work yeah. with, we would work with you like a couple of times, I imagine, mm. like, cause we launched in 2018. So it's yeah. kind of like the couple of years before you launched the business. So are you kind of like working as an influencer for lack of a better word or did you, were you doing think, anything else? I think I was, but unknowingly I probably, so it's funny. My parents are very, almost like slow to times, kind of like most parents were, they were really <laughs> against me posting my face on the internet really, and we yeah. had back and forth arguments. They used to take my phone off me and be like, you get that photo down right now, blah, blah, blah. Like their friends would be sending photos being like, are you seeing what Lexi's posting? And like back in the day, like that was just me on the internet. Mm. Right. But being so early, like 16, 17, that was just not on. So it did start kind of like the classic, like small people, like small brands were sending me little free stuff. Yeah, free like, stuff. <clears throat> like, you know, you got your skinny tees and all of that stuff. Oh, like that's right, just how, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's how my career started on, well, I didn't know it was my career at the yeah. time. And then followed that into my first, second, third year at uni. And then at 21, I, I finished uni at 20 and I had a bit of a gap where I went and interned for a startup in LA. And that's when I kind of like really got my foot in the door with like understanding like, okay, social media is not just a kind of fun little side gig. It's actually something I can do in a career. Yeah. So that's when BC came about. Was that like your first proper experience of like the legit business world, like going over to LA? Because as well, sure. they're kind of on another level to to the way we operate because so everyone, extreme. it's like every every day is like business for them. Like even socializing is business. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing like I probably didn't enjoy about LA is like sometimes you just want to go out and just hang out with your friends and like yes. not everything has to be this strategic conversation mm -hmm. and all that. So I know. Interesting. But what did you get? Like we will we, we rewind because there's a bunch of questions I have, but just while we're on LA, yeah. what's like, what's the main thing kind of lesson that you took away from, from your time in LA? So my time in LA, I mean, it was a bit of a whirlwind. I was 20. So I wasn't actually legally. Couldn't even drink and stuff even legally. Did anyway. that stop me though? No, well, did I did my research, so I know it didn't stop you. It didn't, no. Mm -hmm. So I did head off to um, Coachella Underage, which I won't be, well, no, maybe don't say that. No, no, I'm sure, I'm sure, you want to I'm sure the FBI won't be knocking yeah. on your door because you went to Coachella Underage. Yeah, back in like, we have no <clears> proof technically except my Instagram. But, but yeah. is that even illegal for you or would the venue get in trouble? Like how much can you get in trouble? They let you in. Honestly, facts. You know and you I mean? can actually go to Coachella and not be not 21, drink. but. I just obviously went that step further. Well, you didn't. And no at one, the time no knows, I was so. an influencer though. So I actually remember Bondi Sands was having a huge, huge 21 a, and mm. over event. And I wasn't going to not go to that. So I got my passport and I photocopied it. And then I'd edited like Facetune was like obviously still doing <laughs> then. And I just changed like the date and then printed it off. And because I was Australian, Bondi Sands were like, yeah, sweet. No worries. Come straight like, in, we no recognize questions. that passport. Yeah, you're fine. So I was not about to miss out on that. But when we take it back to career wise, I, LA really changed my mindset on a lot of things. I mean, I was an intern, the first intern for a startup, which is full circle moment, now a client of mine. Wow. So I worked under someone that was so fast paced. He was like, bam, bam, bam. I want this. I want that. And I started selling a social media part of a business that didn't have that to start with. So it was a startup in tech. So I don't want to like bore the details, but pretty much it was like a programmatic marketing tool that was fu cap like funded from yeah. a bunch of VC and angel investors and stuff. And so they didn't have a lot of cash flow coming in themselves from clients. So what I did was I did what I do for BC and for their clients and started doing, you know, influencer marketing content creation, building feeds and everything like that, and then built them out an entire social media arm of their services that they were doing. So then after that, after my time in LA, I came back for my 21st birthday, worked for that for a while um, for the company, but I was waking up at like 3 a.m. because that was 10 a.m. their time. I was like wow. setting alarms for like two in the morning, would work from like two until maybe, maybe like midday for me. And then I just like 
fuck off. I was so tired and I just like was living like a zombie. And the thing with that is like at the time COVID hadn't happened yet. So mm. no one was working remotely. It wasn't normal to be Yeah, uh, like all Zoom. my friends were like post-grad, like working for companies, like living their best life. Mm-hmm. And then I was here like on a computer working from home, which just like wasn't cool back then. So then I just kind of got a little bit, I get tired of it. Mm. And at the time that I was meant to move back over to LA to get the proper visa, the consulate had shut because of COVID. Oh, so you were actually going to go back and and, and move over. Yeah, I was going to go back and move over there because the guy that I worked for was like, come work for me full time. So we were back and forth with the consulate getting the correct visas. And then, yeah, COVID just hit and I was like, okay, I'll become a contractor to you. And then I kind of like one thing led to another. I was a contractor. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe I can get more clients. And then what hit was my full-time salary became like a full-time hours that they were paying me that amount to like becoming a client, which mm. those, you know, those hours just go so much. Of course. They're like two hours a week now for the same price as a full-time to consult to them. Yeah, and then yeah, it just yeah. kind of like fell off um, from there. But then I still have an amazing relationship with my old boss. He's a client of mine now. It's so interesting. Like, so in a way, obviously like you were on, on this journey and you're progressing forward, but like it almost happened by accident by the sounds of it. And like, I feel like a lot of people, when I ask that sort of question, I feel like everyone that's an entrepreneur ha- feels this pressure to say, Oh yeah, I was selling baseball cards. Or I was mm-hmm. had a lemonade stand. Me neither. Like I didn't even realize I wanted to get into business till I was like <clears throat> 22 years old. Like, yeah. and that like, I did the whole uni thing for like three weeks or a couple, maybe two months. Three didn't, weeks. Didn't like it, but like I didn't even know. But I feel like so many people maybe get, if they're thinking about starting a business, but then they'd be like, no, every story I hear, everyone knows they were an entrepreneur, like from like six years old. I'm like, realistically, it's not really the case. Like so many people you don't know until like you grow and like yeah. what, what are you going to just take? Like like you said, you put they put so much pressure on like a 16, 17 year old in yeah. like you picking your subjects for year 11 and 12, like your whole life rides on this decision, but mm-hmm. it's so, it's so far from the truth. Um, you said something else interesting as well. You moved over from, from England to mm. Australia when you were 11. What did that like moving experience while you were kind of at that age, just preteen moving over like completely other side of the world. Do you remember much of it? I actually don't. Mm. That's the, so my parents tell me stories about it. My sister, I think remembers a lot more, even though she was much younger than me, she was transitioning in a weird way. We always kind of have these like ongoing jokes about how she reacted to living in a different country. She just didn't understand because she would have been six at the time. So she was just so confused. Whereas for me, I actually was a very open-minded about it. Mm. I kind of was in maybe a phase where it didn't bother me too much. I might've had like a few hiccups here and there, but it's actually really funny. When I first moved to Australia, we moved, we went to school pretty much the next day. And that's a really good thing that mm. I think we did because it just got us back into routine pretty much straight away. And we were mid semester. So we just went to school on maybe a Tuesday and then got the uniform and cracked on with it. And my, the girl who took me around the school, so like my buddy, she's still my best friend now. And she's also an influencer who also went to uni with me, who also went to school with me, who we moved, not, we didn't move to Sydney together, but we pretty much moved within a year of each other. And we still have the same friendship groups. I don't know if you, you might've heard of her before because Maddie Woolley. I think we've worked with her. Yeah, probably. Yeah, we would have, I'm because sure. Because I probably took the photo of her. Yeah, yeah. With the happy skin. Honestly, you probably <laughs> shot each other. Yeah, probably. So like, we've actually grown quite a lot with each other and she was my first buddy. So when I first moved from England. Isn't that crazy? Like so many people aren't friends with their like, was you high school? You would have been like, like primary school they would have put you in. Yeah. 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 Did you come over? You have like a little English accent and everything. But I think I just got good, somewhat bullied out of it, Mm. which sucks now because I wish I had a really cute English accent. I think there's a few words here and there, but not really. So what was that? I was going to ask you, like, obviously you made really good friends with Maddie and that's lasted the test of time. But did you have like a bit of a betting in period where you didn't feel like you fit in or was it pretty cruisy, like straight in? Everyone was accepting of you. And honestly, well, Noosa was a very, I don't know. Noosa was at the time. It's grown so quickly in like the 15 years now. But back in the day, it was actually quite a small town as in when it comes to diversity and Mm. in particular being English. I think I was the only, even though I'm only half Asian, I think I was the only Asian girl in my school, not my school, but my, at least my classes. And so that definitely had, I think, an impact on me 
kind of having to, like, I've always been quite outspoken and quite, I guess, out there and loud. And I think maybe like that stemmed from there is kind of like fitting in that way, I think, like, mm. because I was, yeah, very different at the start. So then moving from school, you go to uni. What, what did you study at uni? Business management. So marketing and international. Business. How did you make the decision to pick, pick that degree? Do you remember the Honestly, thought process? I think it was just because it was the only thing that I like, knew about. Mm. I just didn't really know much about anything else. And I think at the time business was one of those things that you could probably apply to anything. And I think that was probably the only thing that I could be like solid about. And I'm so grateful that I did that now because whilst I can't really tell you anything I actually learned, I think that there was a lot of value from just like learning, I guess, more things about myself more so. And I had a lot of fun with it. I thought uni was so good. Mm -hmm. I loved it. That was, you, you predicted my next question. Yeah. And cause I don't want to always seem like I'm, I'm really hard on university, but like nearly everyone I ask, uh, when I, when I asked like, what's the what did you learn about business and uni that you actually use? It's, it's always like, yeah. oh, look, I didn't learn much, but the experience is really yeah. good. And, you know, so it's like, yeah. But is there, and do you remember anything like from the business aspect of it that you realize like, oh, I'm glad I learned that because it actually applies to what I do today or. All right, guys, just quickly, I've got some news. I've spent close to the past 18 months building the ultimate program that takes you through the complete process. And I mean the complete process of launching and scaling your very own e-commerce brand from zero all the way up to a million dollars plus per year. And now with this program, what you're going to get access to is 15 modules with over 100 training videos and 23 hours of in-depth content, taking you through everything you need to know to build a successful e-com brand. And this is the important part. This isn't just stuff that you can look up on YouTube. This is stuff I've taken from real lessons and experiences building Happy Skin Co. from zero all the way up to an eight figure per year brand. You're gonna get access to loads of custom tools, templates and calculators that I've used to build and run Happy Skin Co. There's gonna be one-on-one -on -one mentoring with myself and other expert coaches. And there's also weekly group Q&A calls with myself to make sure you're feeling completely supported throughout the entire process. And now what I've learned from consulting to everyone from people starting their very first e-commerce brand all the way up to brands already doing seven figures plus per year is that there's a process and a framework to follow if you want to be successful with e-com. Now, if this is something you're interested in, hit the link below and go to join.viralbrandbuilder.com. All the information's there and you can book a call directly with me. Otherwise, send me a DM and we can chat there. Anyway, let's get back to the pod. Okay, there's one subject that really actually I still remember and that was like product market fit. Mm -hmm. So that was all about very focused on consumer behavior and how to bring a business, like a new company to market. That was really interesting to me. Another thing is like basic microeconomics. I loved microeconomics, macro as well a little bit, but I really loved supply, demand, understanding like how those worked, literally drawing graphs. Like to me, I've, I learned a lot from that and I still apply that, I guess, to my day to day. Not really as much as like I don't draw pie graphs or any graphs about supply and demand, but I definitely learned a lot about, I think consumer behavior was a big one. Um, we did little things about marketing. It's so funny because I went to UQ, which is like very like old school. And so I think we did one subject on social media perhaps, but not just one subject. I mean like one lecture slide yeah, wow. about social media. And no, that wasn't even that long ago. What, like no. eight years? How long ago were you in uni? Five? Oh, wait, you're actually pretty young. Yeah. Right? I'm like, Oh, I think five years. Yeah. Ago. Shit. Four years ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there was nothing about social media. No, not really. Well, there, well I don't want to say nothing like there was, but it wasn't at the forefront of what it should be. So, so yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off. So when you were doing social media for that, that tech startup in the U S and then you come and you're yeah. like, I'm going to start, you know, my own little thing. What did doing social media look like then versus today? Like how much has that changed? I think about the time that I wanted to start a TikTok account. And I think about that, like the dumbest decision of my life, not doing that. Mm -hmm. So I was an intern at 20 living in LA doing all the fun things. I went to like Coachella and I did all those fun, crazy things there. Why did I not just start vlogging? Because honestly, who knows where I'd be now? Yeah. I think about it all the time. Social media obviously has changed a lot. I actually used to have a bigger following than I do now. I did actually like ditched my 150K Instagram account. So what happened? Did you get like, was it, like, was there some drama with that? Like, would you get hacked or no, did you just like delete no, no, no. it? Like what's the. So this is probably the first time I've actually probably spoken about it. I'm doing, I'm actually. I don't know if who I was emailing about this or messaging, but I just ran, finished wrapping up like a uni course. So I'm running 
a course for a fashion college oh, on cool. social media and influencers. And I did this big spiel today about the implications of like actually being an influencer on and the pressure of that. And at 20, that was just tenfold for me. Like I remember being in a group of friends. There was, and these girls are amazing. They're my, still my friends now, like Mads obviously, and like all my friends are influencers. But the detrimental like effect that that actually did have on me, I can't even like begin to explain. Like everything was about likes. Everything was about like following. And I think upon reflection, like I don't regret anything, but I did have, I did follow grow my following to 150K. But as you're growing, no number is ever enough. So I ended up actually just hitting, I think it was maybe 20, beginning of 2020 when I was starting my company and I just decided I don't want to do the influencer thing anymore. A, because the pressure of the likes and the followers and all of that stuff, I just knew that that wasn't really where I wanted to be. Another thing is like the pressure of like it's it back then came down to very much looks. Having like big personality on Instagram and stuff wasn't actually the forefront of how you would grow. It actually came down to like how pretty – your pictures were and how pretty your reels were and stuff like that. And I just didn't, I don't think I fit into that as much as I thought I did when I was growing up upon reflection. I always wonder, you know, maybe I should have just kept that account going and just like turned it into a businessy thing, which I ended up doing. Mm. Um, but maybe I should have done that earlier. I don't know. So talk me through the headspace because like, I think it's still ultra relevant, particularly for like the next it generation is, yeah. coming through. Like you've, you've edited this little reel. Or I'm sure back then it was mainly photo, yeah, you know, was, when yeah. you, when you started and you post and like, are you straight away on your phone? Like watching how many likes come in, how fast. And like, if it's not at a certain amount in an hour, are you like, fuck, should I delete it? Like, I actually think so. You're bringing back a lot of memories here. Cause I feel like I've moved so far on to like mm. from that part, part of life. But yeah, when I was so I think the original question was what I learned in LA about social media. And I think going back to that, it was like when I was living there, that was probably when the pressure for me was at its highest, where I would actually have to set, I would set an alarm and wake up in the middle of the night to post Sydney to uh, Australian time. And I think that was the time where I was like having probably the most pressure. It was a time when I could have taken another step in my career and gone down the business route, which I ended up doing or the influencer route. And so I think when all of your, my friends were all in it and I think that might have been the most detrimental at the time because I think when all my friends were hitting you know, 700K, 800K, getting flown across the world, buying houses off the money that they were getting from Instagram and that wasn't happening for me as quickly, the pressure that I felt on myself was like the most I feel like even running a business now I felt. So it's, it's, it's a really like, I think Instagram, I wasn't, I had to not have been the only one though, because Instagram took initiative to remove likes completely. Um, TikTok's obviously still not doing that, but I think that the attention now has gone mostly to like kind of content creation instead. And now it's more about, but you think about it, like your pay, you pay influencers, right? So if an influencer gets 10,000 likes, you're paying them $4,000, whatever. Okay. That's probably off, but whatever. And then if they get 200 likes, you probably like, Oh, gifted. Right. So the difference like on a macro scale for that is the difference between an algorithm picking you up or not picking you up. That is free holidays, enough money to like buy a house and a car that you've always dreamed of, do all of these amazing things in in life. And that came down to a single platform. So I think for me, like I kind of got over the pressure of like how my Instagram and stuff was performing because I knew that I had this other business side of me that was going to actually take the brand side and that part of Instagram influencing and content creation and social media a little bit further and outside of that. So now I've kind of got my own thing as an influencer now, which I feel is more business related, that type of content instead Mm. of just like myself in a bikini to be yeah does it's, that it, make sense I yeah it know. does That's a lot of words <clears throat> no it does Maybe could you do me a favor and just angle this to your mouth as well because yeah it's better joe I've, I've there's been so many times where i've seen someone doing that and i'm like oh i want to say something i want to say something but i don't because i don't want to say it. and then we hear the audio back like fuck i wish i said something i can't even repeat what i just said <clears throat> no 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 no, no. that's know. good this is for like this is I, for moving on like, I just it's, like yeah, word yeah, vomit. yeah 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 no um no no all good um so it's interesting you said something 
which I, I kind of want to get you to unpack if you can and like try and explain it. Cause I think it's like, fuck, there'd be so many people, probably mainly females, but like you said the pressure and that you felt being in like the, an influencer and living in that world was, was even more so than being in, in business and running your business and being an entrepreneur. And mm-hmm. that's interesting because I know how much pressure and stress can come yeah. from that. How would you explain the difference between yeah. kind of the sh- different kinds of like stress and pressure from, from those two worlds? I think for me, I mean, they're, they're significantly different. I'm not going to about to take away the pressure that the business side is because that is like a whole different ball game. I think it was less more pressure on for me with, as an influencer, it was very much like looks. It was yeah. very much like how does, how is this picture going to be perceived to like men and women and how is it going to like look pretty and everything like that with my business? The pressure is not on like how I look at all. It's all about like, how am I growing? How do I present myself? What is my strategy? How am I, how am I scaling? All of those things. And that's the type of pressure I enjoy. Okay. I'd say that lightly. I don't always enjoy, enjoy. but yeah, enjoy like, yeah. Okay. With, we'll put some salt on that one, <laughs> yeah. but like, obviously for me, I feel I enjoy where I am in life like a lot better now that I have the pressure off how my content personally is performing mm. I couldn't give it like a flying I don't know can you yeah you can swear as much as you want if my reel gets like 10, <laughs> like one like now I'm like sweet I, Whatever. I, I couldn't care less if you told me I actually was saying this to my um, one of my best friends the other day if you told me my tw- my 18 20 year old self that I was not going to post on Instagram for five days and not give a shit I would not believe you, but now I just don't. And I'm like, I'm sweet. I don't even and care. only five days as well. Like that's unimaginable to like, you know, yeah. your self and like, now yeah, I'm I just used like, to whatever. Like, oh my God, got to post every day and it's got to be like the best photo ever. But now I just couldn't go flying fuck. And like, do you feel the pressure? And it's, it seems like, and, I, and I've listened to podcasts where people explain it as well. And it's like, obviously humans, particularly in that age, like late teens, early twenties, like everyone's driven, like it's all about status and how, and how it looks to everyone else. Mm. And it's like, you, the more likes you get, the better you feel. So you want to do the things that uh, tend to attract more likes. Isn't that so far? And often with girls, it's like, okay, show more skin, mm-hmm. wear less clothes, look more fit or work your angles better. Don't portray anything that yeah. looks real. Does that start to like mess up sort of that like view of like a healthy relationship to like oh, yourself and, yeah. and your body and, and things like that? Because it's just like, I need to present this yeah. to get that. I think luckily I stopped before it actually got to that point. I don't think like I never, I've always been quite confident in maybe, maybe my actual business drive actually was able to combat ever getting to the point where I feel that way. But I'm, I know a hundred percent that there are people out there that are still feeling that way, even though the industry has shifted a lot more to what kind of, what do you contribute from something for something a little bit deeper? So personality on TikTok is a huge thing now. Um, having like a skill or an actual like opinion on something or having, you know, like just being like a video person that talks about like feelings and talks about, you know, there's so many out there. I feel like it has actually steered away from the looks and everything. There's of of course out there and I follow so many pretty girls and I'm like, fuck, she's so hot. Like Mm. I love her and I love her style and everything like that. But I think there's a lot more purpose to why people follow now, which I think is the best possible way that we could have moved forward from that phase. And I'm like super grateful that I feel like I did change direction of life at the right time. Mm, Well, even thinking like back to business, like if we were going to like work with a bunch of influencers you know, four or five years ago, it was just, okay, look pretty and hold a product and write in a little sure. caption. Now it's like, that's not enough. Like you need to, like you said, be interesting, be like, have your own sort of style of content creation and add some sort of value. So it's, it's, it's a good positive move that that, that happened. But like you said, there's still so many people that would struggle with that. I feel like taking the likes away or like being able to hide likes was such a big controversial thing, but it probably actually did really help people's mental health. Now, going into business and, and that other type of pressure mm. that, that you, you know, you, you smile and laugh, like you enjoy and you do enjoy it, but there's days where you want to beat your head against the wall and be like, why did I choose this life? Like, I get it. Every day. I get it. I get it. How do you feel like being in business and that stress and pressure has affected your mental health? Do you think it's been a positive or do you think it's been like a challenge at times? I was talking to my boyfriend just before I was like crossing the road up there. And I was like to them, I was like to him, I was like, should I tell them that I've just like started 
therapy. <laughs> like you'd be you'd be surprised how many people <laughs> like, on the, the last mm. like you know, 10 guests that have been on the podcast, like one in two has talked about, yeah, I just recently started therapy. And it's I, great, yeah. yeah, I think like I was saying to her on the consult, I'm only at consult level now, but my literal, all I said to her was like, I just want to clear my head because there's so many people around business owners. That's your parents, your your siblings, like your friends, your partners and whatnot. And the amount I found like the more pressure I'm under, the more pressure they're under to kind of like just be my mate and be like my partner and be my, and so the reason for me going and taking the step to therapy is just genuinely so that I can actually like free up space when I'm with these people. And so that I'm able to actually get, carry myself a lot. I might like, carry myself better when I'm like going to work. Another thing you say, you said about like, you know, how is that, like, is that mentally made me feel better or worse? I have a team between the ages of 21 and 27. And so some of them are older than me and some of them are younger than me. And my team are my best friends a lot of the time. So where therapy for me comes in is that I want to keep my relationship with them without having the pressure of the things that I go through as a business owner, because they work for me at the end of the day. They're there for their salary. Of course, they love it. And, you know, working for BC is like obviously great. Mm. I would hope so. They seem to give great feedback. So for me, it's like when I'm mentally going through a lot of challenges, how can I remain professional, remain their friend, but then also deal with the problems that I'm dealing with, which is like, you know, every everyone has their own issues as a business owner, but they're all kind of the same. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, like I've combat that by like deciding, okay, like let's go to therapy. Yeah. No, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's a difficult balance as well, particularly mm -hmm. when you're so young in business and so is your team. And it's like drawing the line between we're all best friends, but I'm also the boss. And like, 100%. there's also like, yeah, we can have all like fun and, 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 and it's going to be a fun day. And like, we can play music and mm -hmm. do our little shoots and all that stuff. But the back of the head, you know, X, Y, Z problem that the mm -hmm. team doesn't know about. And they might be like, Oh, she seems a little bit off today. Like well, I wonder why, but like mm -hmm. there's all that behind it. And it's like, much, yeah. there's this perception of business that everyone in business is rich and it's, and it's always oh. easy. And like, Oh, she's got Perfect. 10 staff. Like she must be making so much profit, but it's like yeah. 10 staff is 10 people you need to like feed. And mm -hmm. you put like, that's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Yeah. Particularly as someone's, so young, no real corporate experience. Like you did one little internship in LA. Oh, I think about that all the time. Yeah. I actually just posted a reel about that. I was like, my biggest advice, if you're going to get into the business world is go and work for someone else, because the things that you learn working for anyone is so important to the skills you're going to learn when you actually work, not just for yourself, but also have other people work for you. Things like We've moved over to a limited company and we have payroll and we have all those things. I've never been on a payroll before. I've never set up my own super account. I've never done all of those things and I've never wrote an employee handbook to what is normal for lunch break, what is normal for annual leave, like all of those things. But if I worked for someone else, I probably could just take what I what was normal mm. there and apply it to my, my job, my business now. But I, I'm literally asking my friends that work at fashion companies. So like, what happens when you like go to lunch? Do you all go to lunch together or do you like, and what happens if you're sick on a Monday because you're hung hungover? Is that a sick day? Like these things mm. that like you should know if you work, you would know if you worked for someone else, but I just don't. So what, what do you think was the hardest part or like, yeah, what do you think was the hardest part of launching a business at 21 years old? It had to have been not really knowing mm. what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. Of course, everything starts and grows slowly. So for me, I knew there was a few things I was 100% certain on. One was how to make really, really good content because my account at that point had grown so much and I was really good at it for doing, doing it for other businesses as an influencer. So that was, I already knew that. And then another thing was I had an amazing dad who had, sold his company for a decent amount of money and he had, what do you call it, like structure, operations, legal background, a lot of stuff to help me build it. One thing is like I'm always, I've always had like that support. My dad's very strict on like, you know, he'll give me his time but never his money kind of thing. So like when it came to launching the business, like he really helped me with the structure. He still does. Like I'll call him up whilst he's not in the day-to-day -day at all. He'll I'll call him up and be like, oh, like what do I do about this particular thing? And he'll give me his advice. But for me, like there was a few things I was 100% certain on. But also when I was 21, I actually didn't think it would turn into anything. 
I thought I was going to become a consultant until the borders actually opened up and I was going to go work in LA. That was literally my plan. And then as clients came and I was actually building something really important, I realized that obviously there was a lot more to it now, Mm. but I didn't, yeah, I actually had no, I guess, scale plan at all. On your dad, it's actually like now that I've had the experience, you, anyone in business that would like, it's way better to have the advice than the money. Oh my gosh, of course. Way better to have the advice and the, and the money, particularly as a young entrepreneur, which a lot yeah. of people that listen to the podcast would be, would, would be quite young. Does anything stand out as like one piece of advice or, or any tip that your dad gave you about structure or recruitment or anything mm. like that or legalities that was like, I'm so fucking glad he told me that because if I didn't know that, I could have made a big mistake. Okay, let me just think about that for one second. Yeah. Sorry, give me like- Do I add some thinking music right now? Tick, tock, tick, tick. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is like, he's actually given me so much that I couldn't even like put it down to one thing. I think, I mean, for me, like he, so pretty much everything when it comes to like structure within our company, but also like he was a consultant too. So he really understands like everything that comes into like balance sheet stuff. I'm so bad at numbers. And I think the more I work with him, the more, the less I'm like the more I'm aware of how it just bad rocks I your am. confidence because I'm, they're so good. Oh right? my god, he was like, he, so he does his my profit and loss. He'll like look at the balance sheet and he'll be doing all of the all of the numbers. And I'm like, what is going on? Because he was a CFO prior, so he's like done the chartered accountancy stuff. So I think like the biggest piece of advice that my dad has kind of put into me is that like business is pretty much nothing if you don't understand the numbers. It's all good to you know like have a pretty business and everything like that. But like at the end of the day, if you're profit and loss is in red constantly. Like it's going to be a really dangerous game to be playing. Um, that was that, that for me is like the biggest part of like the constant learning I have from him is like having him come in and like, look at the numbers and everything. Cause at the end of the day, that's like my biggest weakness. And so there, I mean, like, I'm going to look back on this podcast and be like, Oh, I wish I said that X, y, Z, quote thing. he said, but like, he just talks so much to me about so mm. many things that like, I can't really put like my finger on one thing, but I think when it comes to the accounting side, like he's definitely like the forefront of that for me. I think it's a really important part. And, and like some people are lucky to have that in their family or in their immediate network. Some, some aren't like, mm. I was lucky about a year in, I hired my cousin who's like six years older and he's like, he was like a CFO and managing like billion dollar projects and stuff. So it's like, I was very lucky to have him and he is the same thing. He taught me so much about, you know, mm-hmm. profit and loss and, and, and cash flow and, and margins and all that sort of stuff. And like, he'll be whizzing around an Excel sheet so fast mm-hmm. and he'll be like, you got all that. And I'm thinking, fuck, I'm done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tax. It's like it's tax. In the, it took me, it, and it takes like, if you're not that sort of like minded person, it can take oh. a little bit of time, but it's like, that's why as well, if you don't know, it's better to grow slow in the early stages, yeah. whereas most people just want to grow, grow, grow. And it's like, yeah. if we didn't have like, if we didn't have a lot of profit, like yeah. a high profit percentage in the first year, we, we would have made, it would have been really difficult for us because of some yeah, really of basic errors we made just because we just didn't know any better. None of us. So I launched it with, with a business partner who, 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 who was around for about a year, but we, neither of us had any business experience running a business. So how would we know? We were just going the best off we could. Like, sure. We'll listen to podcasts and watch YouTube videos and, you know, read books, but you never really know until you do something. Does, I know you had your father there to kind of guide you and hopefully would have helped minimize some mistakes, but looking back at like the early days in business or the first couple of years, is there a mistake that you made there was like, was a big mistake at the time, but ended up being like a very valuable lesson. Doesn't have, it can be with numbers or, or team or whatever it may be. Okay. Sorry. Thinking music again, Joe. Like a million, like a million. Do people usually just like pause for a second? You can pause. Edit it out? No, but we, we, you will probably keep it in, but if it's oh, long perfect. enough, if it's long enough, um, oh. we can edit it out. <laughs> oh, cause I like have so many mistakes. I feel that. Well, I'm just playing. hit me with a couple first couple that come to your head. Then first thing that comes. I think head. the thing is, is like, I can't really say that there was like so many mistakes because like, I also only launched this business three years ago and like, it's kind of been like an exponential thing. So there wasn't any like huge setbacks. I did have, but and then again, there was something that happened and has happened to me three times and I'm not going to name any names here because like, that's really important. But I had a bit of an issue with like my NDA kind of things with, um, with girls that worked for me. So in saying that I have six staff now and I've only ever had three other people. 
And let's just say that when you are in a business industry that does not have any sunk costs, really, you just need a laptop and a camera, not even a camera, actually, sorry, just your phone. That leaves a lot of, I guess, open opportunity for people that work for you to learn a lot of things and then go on their own. So this happened to me three times. Three Three times. times. Like, And I actually started like really like hitting my head against the wall. I'm like, what am I teaching these people? Am I just like either making it look too easy or am I just oversharing because I'm a huge oversharer? Like I'll probably look back on this podcast and be like, (laughs) why did I say that? Like, but yeah, so that's actually, I don't want to say it's a mistake, but it's definitely something that I've had to, I guess it was a mistake because I didn't have any documents to cover myself. Like I didn't have like really strict non-competes. I didn't have any strict like NDAs about our IP. I didn't have a lot of anything really to protect me saying, you know, you can't go and like start your own within like you, but like technically you can go and start your own. That's no problem. But like, you can't go and like get our clients or use all of the things that you did with us and like go and apply that to your own thing. The fact that it happened three times was then an awakening to be like, okay, like let's fix this problem because obviously there was something going wrong here that I was Mm. making it too easy to start their own. And then, yeah, just obviously like giving too much information away. But yeah, I don't actually know what ended up happening to most of them. I don't know. Maybe some of them are still running or they're not. I'm not sure. But yeah, that would, I would say like, I wish at the very beginning, maybe I was a lot stricter on like how much information I was giving away to staff and then also like make, be, making sure I had protection against like them just mm. leaving and starting a direct competitor. I know that there's legality around it. You technically can go and do it over a certain amount of time if you do a non-compete, but, and we won't get into that, but like there is, I would say one of my lessons where I was like, oh, God damn it, Lexi, like why did you not see this happening? Or like why did you not protect yourself? Like those are the few things. I would say. So that, that, yeah, I I always like to ask that because obviously we learn the most from our mistakes. It's like, Mm -hmm. as people listen to this and hear everyone's stupid mistakes, it's like, okay, that's something to be aware of. But a lot of these things, like you can hear it on a podcast, but until you experience it and and it happens to you, it's like, oh, that'll never happen to me. You know what I mean? And then it happens and you're like, fuck. I think everything for me is like, because we're client based, we're working with so many different personalities. So my, um, my biggest learning thing, and it still happens. We learned something yesterday. Yesterday I sat down with the whole team because we had a bit of a client mishap about communication and there being issues with our contracts and everything like that. There was just something that was kind of like left maybe a little too late. And so we sat down as a team and we're like, oh, you know, we need to actually fix up our areas in the contract. So for us, like the contract I worked at three years ago with like what we send to clients is completely different now because of everything that we get filled in. So once we had a client that we hire models and photographers and studio, <laughs> like before we had our own studio, we had to hire that too. And we had this one client that did not pay any of them, like didn't pay the contract. So it didn't, <coughs> didn't pay the models, didn't pay like the studio or anything like that. And that meant from then on, that was a huge mistake for me is that I actually paid for those things and never got paid back. So now like our contracts say, do you want me to like, wait? No, I'm just, I had a sip of water (laughs) and it went down the wrong pipe. Hate that. Technical difficulty. Beauty of live, live podcasting. Yeah. But so pretty much, I guess for me, like every single issue or mistake we like we have we just fix up like with like the mostly it's contract stuff yeah it's the way that we like I have a new thing where I have set expectations now I never used to I'd be like a client would come and sit down I'd be like we will make everything for you you just sit down and you just chill and we'll just like make your whole business for you and like don't you worry two thousand dollars a month like we will yeah we'll make that back and like not now yeah. we're just now my I'm like, okay, here is what you're paying for. This is like what we're so good at. Like, here's some examples. Like, mm. we're great at this, but I'm not selling a dream anymore. I'm being more realistic. But whether I had to do that at the start, maybe I did. Well, what do you think on that? Because everyone goes into that, like, oh, I want to make it seem as good as I can. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to give anyone any reasons to not sign with me. Yeah. And then like you go through and you try and deliver all these, like, you know, rainbows and sunshine that everything was meant to work really smoothly. Being more realistic and, and setting expectations yeah. and realistic time frames and what to expect and how long until this happens and how long till that happens. Have you found it more difficult to, to sign clients or has it not affected it? 
I have found that it makes it that much easier. Mm. I'm getting clients exactly right. that really understand what we're going to, what we're going to give to them in a realistic. So it's just, it's easy. It's so easy to just say, you know, here are the services we do. Here are a few other things you could be doing alongside us. I come as, come in as a consultant now. So when my clients come on, whilst we at BC and have like our four services that we're really freaking good at, which is like social media, content creation, influencers, and sometimes we'd like dabble into events, but TikTok management is like the forefront of everything we do now. We are really good at those few things. But when it comes to like business, I have a few other ideas outside of BC now, and I have a few, well, not a few ideas, a lot of ideas on how businesses could actually operate outside of BC. And so things that I'm consulting to clients on hire a PR company. Here's a few that I love. Here's the emails. And like, there's so much more value that you get out of BC now because we're more honest about here are the things we're going to actually do for you, but like, let's have a chat and I'll kind of point you in the right direction for things that we don't do. And but back then, back like two years ago, a client would be like, Oh, can you do this, this, and this? And I'm like, yeah, we can walk your dog for you. Absolutely. (laughs) Like that's like, That's in the contract. Perfect. But now being more realistic and saying, you know, here's what we do. There's an amazing ads company over the road that we can recommend to you. Um, Here's a photographer because we use iPhones and our little like Canon things like these ones that you've got are like, they're great, but we don't have, we are social media management. We're doing everything UGC related. So if that's outside of that scope, we have amazing partners to take them to. And I think that's the moment I got to because I was trying to do everything to try and service everything, but you just can't do that. Like specialist agencies is now like the way to go. Yeah. And I, I think that's where people, <clears throat> and I think to, to be fair at the really early stages when mm. it's just you or like you and like one helper, it's kind of good to say yes to everything because like you need just get as much cash yeah. into the business as you can. You'll learn skills and then you'll quickly learn as you start building the business and growing that holy shit, that's actually taking way more time and it's not delivering any real value to your business. And realistically to the client's business, if it's not your main forte. Yeah. But so speaking of like your, your main strength, one of them being TikTok management, yeah. let's just say a new brand comes to you. They've, they've been operating for say six, 12 months. They've had a really good start, like a little e commerce yeah. brand. What does TikTok in management involve? They say, oh, okay, we, we, we want help with this. What, what does that look like? Okay. I love that question. So we, so we're pretty much like an end to end, like UGC related, like pretty much to Put it shortly, it's organic social media. So TikTok is one of those platforms that needs strategy behind it in order to actually grow. Of course, you can like dump some things every now and again, and we've seen success doing that. And you know what? Like some of our brands, that is actually our strategy. It's like to just any trend, we grew a random company that was like owned by a pharmaceutical company by literally just dumping every trend that was relevant to the product. We just did and we just filmed it and we just uploaded it and it did really, really well. Um, where we, I guess, structure our TikTok now is that we find that obviously other outside of paid advertising, it is like the fastest growing organic platform. So one of my videos randomly popped up and it was my boyfriend's ear like flapping in the wind mm. and it got almost 10 million views. And so that just randomly pops off. And so for us, we found that TikTok, it, we actually use it pretty much for like every direct to consumer client. Now we're actually going down the B2B level as well now. So personal branding is also a big thing. So for you, like this entire podcast is an opportunity to grow on TikTok and have your personal brand elevated. So for us, what we do is we take the e-commerce. So back to the actual question, taking the e-commerce brand, looking at the customer, looking at the opportunity on the platform, where are the opportunities to grow? Who, who are we actually targeting? And then we build out the strategy from there. We have a really powerful in-house solution that we've created in UGC, which is that we have six girls that work in the office and we have a content space. So now it went from a client having to pay 40 different creators for 40 videos to hiring just be seen and getting six to seven content creators, all doing amazing approved concepts, getting them edited and then actually uploaded for them too in an approval process. So like we've actually like our internal UGC solution has provided not only getting rid of the admin for individual creators, being so much cheaper, but also having way more control because you probably see, I don't know, I don't know whether you've like outreached to like 10 different people to create content for you. And maybe like 
three or four of them hit the nail on the head with the brief and you can't exactly turn around and be like refilm with us. You can absolutely say that we had a bucket company um, that was an amazing product and they came back with feedback saying, you know, there's a few of them weren't like clicked on properly. So we will just refilm them, mm. but you can't do that if it's like a It's creator. powerful to be able to do that so quickly yeah. with the team in house. Are you, are you filming content? How many days a week are the girls every filming day. content every day? Yeah. So if you see a trend, right, let's just say, cause Obviously you're running a business working with multiple clients. You have to be structured, right? You might mm -hmm. plan out the whole month's worth of content, but if you see a, a trend popping off, obviously you want to get onto that as soon as you can, as early in the piece, will you then go film it and like kind of put that in Straight today away. rather than waiting? Okay. <clears throat> let's put this in at the end of our scheduled yeah. post for the next month. We actually, it's funny you say that because we just had a meeting with a corporate client that has a really strict approval process to like global or like to their top tier directors. And they were like, oh, you know, guys, we really need, um, you know, our content approvals to spreadsheet for a month worth of content. And I was like, you are literally ruining yourself yeah, by doing that. Because the purpose, right? if Kira Lee, who is my head of TikTok, she sees a trend, she's going to jump on that straight away and mm -hmm. she's going to upload it probably. Well, obviously we want to give you your approval. We're not going to start doing something rogue, but get that approval within the day. It will go up and it'll do well. That's so sick, we yeah. pretty much do our TikTok management on fortnightly, but sometimes weekly mm. approvals so that yeah. that can just go up straight away. And with trends as well, it's really important. And, and so I know, so a big part of your, what you guys do is TikTok. The other side, like obviously you do multiple things, but yeah. the other big one is like influencer management and outreach for small businesses. Obviously the accessibility and the role of influencers has changed a lot. Even since I launched the business like five and a bit years yeah. ago for small businesses, realistically, what role do you see them play? Like when, when you're working with influencer of your clients, what role does the influencers play versus TikTok? So with our UGC solution, we've managed to eliminate a lot of the back and forth with actual influencers. So there's a huge difference between influencers and then content creators, right? So UGC creators are actually popping off a lot now because you don't necessarily, as a brand, you don't always see value in paying for someone because of their following, but because their content's really good. So now the whole industry is almost shifted to like majority of the content just being created by the people and not actually being posted because it's like the quality of the content is more important than reaching their audience because that might not convert. Yeah. So what we now do is we almost focus on the quality of the content for the client and actually having a really, really, really good consistent amount of content going up with different faces because there's a, quite a few of us and we'll always bring content creators in every now and again if we don't fit the look of the brand. We did, we've done a few brands before that like we're just not the audience for. So we have to go out to our network and be like, hey, can anyone do this brand? And we'll come in and shoot it and everything. But with influencers, of course, like we still are doing that for, you know, reach and everything like that. But I am definitely noticing the impact and investment. I'm trying to I'm trying to be real with our clients and say, you know, you might have a reach at this event of like 2 million because there's 500 K there, 30 K there. And like the combined reach is going to be that, but please do not come to me mm. upset that like there was only a few sales from that person and that person because influencer marketing is unfortunately still how long is a piece of string yeah. where we as a company have decided to take control of that part is by providing really high quality influencer style content because I was the influencer that trained all these girls, not all of them. Some of them actually like are really good on their own. Like, I don't <laughs> want to take credit for their skills. I take credit for all of it. Yeah, okay. honestly. But yeah, so pretty much like they have actually like learned from me how to, you know, style content really well to like frame content really well. We do big jewelry clients now where all the girls are just as good as I am, even though I was an influencer for six, seven years first. And that's where like, we've kind of combated that to value our clients without having to hire a shit ton of influencers. But most of my friends still are influencers. So I'm not shitting on it. I still, we still love you. But, but I, I feel like it's <clears throat> influencers like as well for, for like more of like that startup sort of like e-com brand, mm -hmm. you know, it's just one person or they've got like two, three staff, like they're still mm -hmm. really lean. It's like the, what a, like a, an influencer with a few hundred thousand followers will cost versus like mm. what you can predict they're going to return has obviously changed a lot. And my theory is like, as coming from the brand side, yeah. obviously influencers are still getting heaps of work, but like from what I see and you, and you'd know a lot because all your friends are influencers, like 
three years ago. Awesome. I'm like only hanging out with influencers. Yeah, I only hang out with Sorry, influencers. Sorry, you, you can't be my friend if you've got less. No, <laughs> yeah. absolutely If you don't have at least 50K, like I'm not going to be seen in public <laughs> with you. But um, so like if you looked at all the, like all the influencers doing like posts and, and, and clubs three years ago, like 80, 90% would be with like e-comic sort of brands. Mm. Now, because the big corporate multinational companies are so far behind, it's like, oh, influencers now influencers still getting paid and they can charge whatever big oh, international yeah, company five can. grand for a post. And I'll be like, sure. Cause they don't really, I aren't able to track attribution for a company that mm-hmm. big unless they're doing specific things, but they don't even really realize it's not their money. They're working these massive corporate, like massive yeah. corporations. It's like very different when you're working with a small business owner is like, if I pay you oh, three okay. grand, I'm hoping you make yeah. at least X back or yeah. I'm going to be losing money on this. You know what I mean? I've made a slight rule that, my my clients cannot invest money into influencer posts with if it's not reinvested from the business because a lot of the time my launch clients what's hard and this is difficult and it's not like this isn't my set rule but this is my advice is that i've seen it time and time again where you know these people are taking paying from the same money that they could you know, buy a pair of shoes or like eat for the mm. week into like an influencer that's a thousand dollars kind of hoping that will come back and it doesn't. And so for me, like my biggest like consulting advice is like, if you're going to invest in them, I definitely support it. And I think when it comes to influencer marketing myself, I've seen success in actually changing the strategy a little bit more into rather than just posting, just having one Instagram post or one reel is maybe invest more in like three posts from the one person Instead, because like that memory and that brand awareness will then convert a little bit more in the in the minds of like the people that are actually seeing the stuff. For me, I definitely see a response if I have three booked in stories. The first click views, uh, it's okay. Second, a bit higher. Third, hundreds. It's way more organic as well doing yeah. it that way, right? And, and it's like it's it's like for the businesses that do do that. I do a lot of consulting to the, and mentoring to like econ brands as well. Yeah. And be like, okay, should I? You know, there's this influencer who have quoted me, you know, fifteen hundred dollars. Do you think I should do it? And it's like it really is. It's like gambling these days. It is gambling. Like you know who mm. does it really well? Stacks do this really well. Stacks have really long. You've got a stack shirt on. Is that stacks? Yeah, yeah. stacks. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like the biggest fan of stacks because they really look after you as an influencer. You like really. You just feel really like important and they really give a lot of attention to you. And like the emails are really like, because they bring out so many new exciting things and you're they're constantly giving to their influencers back. Like whether that's like gifting, they're not strict on like posting deliverables. They have like an affiliate program. So you get a percentage of your sales instead of just like dedicated posts. And I feel like they've hit the nail on the head with like a being an influencer driven brand because they were so, their product is good. So then anyone that's going to talk about it, it's going to like the, the customers are actually going to rebuy because they actually had a really good experience with the brand already. So they're like, they might not convert. I might post stacks and people might not buy straight away, but when they're looking for activewear in a month's time, they'll remember that stacks was in my bio and things. And I think some new startup companies, they don't get They don't see it as brand awareness, but maybe we need to kind of change the tone of being, you know, like you might not, you might not remember. So if I'm shopping for jewelry, right, I might not be shopping for jewelry the 24 hours that that story is up by my favorite influencer. But when I am shopping for jewelry, I might have, I might remember that Mm -hmm. and be like, oh, I remember what was that brand again? Oh, okay. That company. So like, I do think like there is a whole picture to look at when it comes to influencer marketing, not just specifically like what's going up at that specific time. I think it does have a big part of it, but I do think brands need to look at it as an investment in the long term rather than just what's going on right now and like refreshing their sales. Like why is this not happening? Because it is going to be the long game at the end of the day. Exactly. I think that's the biggest way it changed. And that's what stacks do really well. It's like, they don't just do heaps of like one-off posts. It's like they're partners. Like if you work with stacks, like you're a partner, you know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. like, you'll consistently be in front of them. And like a lot of people will hear stories of how it used to be back in the day. Mm -hmm. Like you do a post and then like you paid an influencer a thousand dollars and they made you $4,000 back. Yes. Sweet. It's very different now. You mentioned affiliate programs for someone who's got relationships with, with influencers. Now for the startups <clears throat> that want to start investing and working with influencers mm-hmm. from the influencer side, I know it's like if, if brands are just going to pay you heaps up front, obviously you want to take that. Where influencers heads are in terms of doing like an affiliate model, 
will they still want the same amount up front? And then a percentage of sales, will they be open to doing a little bit less mm. in sales? Will, will some just be like, I'll just post it. And then a commission of sales kind of where's the headspace of like the influences that, you know, that are out and about at the moment. I know a lot of people actually wouldn't be happy with just affiliate. I know a lot of people wouldn't necessarily, because you have to build up quite a lot for it to then be profitable for you as the influencer as well. And you have to be like really loyal to making sure that you're posting. It's kind of almost like a very, very mini, mini, mini profit share model. Exactly. But yeah. I do. I am aware that I feel like a lot of influencers wouldn't want to do it unless the brand was big enough where people kind of already resonated with the brand like it's not up to some a brand sorry an influencer that's an affiliate to actually like constantly be telling the customers like this is a really good brand this is a really good brand like the brand already needs to be quite well structured for that I think that relationship to be successful so that's why I do think Stax has done that quite well is like I actually I don't think in my whole time working with them I've ever been sent a brief do you know what I mean like so I think I think affiliate marketing, I think it's one of those things that like you can do it really right, but I just don't think majority of influencers is going to respond well to it. No, I, I, I agree. But it's like, it's, it's a challenge. It's like, you need to get your foot in the door, but it's like mm. difficult to have the, the budget and the money. At what point do you recommend, like at what point of the business kind of cycle and growth and maturity, do you think it's the time to properly start investing in influencers? I think you can do it at the very, very beginning if you are open-minded to it, you have a strategy that aligns really, really well with, I guess, the your brands. Like we have a launch package, which has a influencer effort in it. And that is from the very beginning of their, I've launched, I launch businesses probably every month to market with influencers and how we do that is determined by the actual brand, whether they're luxury, whether they're reasonably cheap, whether they're fast fashion, whatever it is. I think that every brand can launch with influencers if they have obviously the proper budget set aside for it, expect a realistic expectation and also are aware that it's the long game. But building relationships with influencers at the very beginning can be so powerful, so powerful. I think it's like incredible to start straight away. So I always, I think maybe even not like investing in it, but at least like thinking about it. I think should be the very, very beginning. And as well, too, so many people would like, oh, Dylan, I emailed 10 influencers. No one replied. Okay, we'll email 100 because it's yeah. not everyone's going to reply. Like it, it's oh really God, difficult at the start from the brand side. Like oh gosh, when we, so we before we had launched, oh shit, yeah. before we had launched, like we were emailing like, you know, 100 people to get like 10 people say yes. Mm -hmm. And then like after a couple of years, We'd email a hundred people. It'd be like 50 people. Like yeah, say, it. do you know what I mean? It's easy, but it takes time. And like from the brand side, it's going to take a while to like get to the point where that effort is less. But so many people just want to like, oh, I give up. Yeah. It's funny you say that because when we haven't launched a brand or we, they're new to working with us, we actually don't take on anything influencer related with them until we've managed it for three months because it's not up to us to sell something to the influencers that they don't necessarily see value in straight away. So we actually have to build up their Instagram. So it's attractive to customers as well as influencers. So like, it's actually funny you say that because like they're banging their head against the wall. Because they're like, oh, no one's responding and whatnot. But it's like, well, if customers aren't necessarily buying from you, like why would influencers want to like promote you to the right, to their audience too? So it's kind of like, it's a really good point to get to with us is like once we're ready to take you on as an influencer, I guess, campaign, like it's all exciting because it means that we've built you up to a good stage in your business to like actually take that on. Yeah. That's a really good point because it can be easy from the brand side to be like, Oh, it's so, it's so difficult. Mm. Influences are so difficult, but it's like, there's always two sides of the picture. Like oh, yeah. it, it, it needs to make sense on both ends. So it's like yeah. building the relationships can be difficult at the start. Maybe that's why like, well, one, put in the work. Like I said, it's going to take longer. You have to send more emails, get rejected more, not hear back more, but eventually you'll start getting some recognition, particularly Definitely, once yeah. like influencers, like, you start working with, it's like anything. You start working with small influencers and mm -hmm. then a little bit bigger than them see it. Then by the time you reach out, okay, I've seen some friends yeah. work with them. It's and the then snowball effect. It's the snowball yeah. effect, like everything, like building that momentum. Same thing with like, you know, if, when, when, like you said, you're taking on clients to start a podcast in the beginning, it's going to be a little bit harder because everyone's like, what the fuck is this random podcast? But it's yeah. like, by the time they've seen all these people go on the podcast, I think they've seen the friend sharing. Well, that like, was me with you I know, guys. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, now yeah. it's like, everyone's like, oh yeah, sweet. Like as soon mm. as someone sees it, it gets like, it's straight away. Yes. But at the beginning it's like, 
you have to earn that kind of respect. You can't just be expect to be given anything. Mm. Um, so I think that's really good, a really important point. Now we'll start to wrap up. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask you like, as someone that started a business very young, kind of not, I wouldn't say fell into it, but you didn't have this long strategic plan. Like you said, you didn't, you didn't even incorporate as a, as a, as a private company until you'd already started and, mm. and made some money. So you being that person, you had your father as a mentor. And I think yeah. having mentors in business is extremely important, Incredibly particularly right. when like you don't have like anyone in your life that you can look to. So that's really important. But were there, were there any books, any podcasts, any courses, videos that you remember mm. reading or listening to or, or watching that, that helped you learn and develop or, mm. or learn a new skill, level up your mindset, anything like that? I'm about to give a best friend shout out. So Grace Beverly is, oh, she's, she's the best, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she's actually one of my really, really good friends and she's actually helped me so much. I used to read her book. So I read her book and then we went to Europe together and she is actually like changed a lot of my mindset when it comes and uh, she's actually upskilled me quite a lot when it comes to, you know, business a lot, maybe not in my particular industry, but actually like running a company. So the day-to-day staff, all of those things. So, um, I think, oh my God, sorry. Is it called working? Don't forgive me, Grace. Working hard, hardly working. I think that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's an inc- incredible book. And then she also has a podcast that goes alongside it. And that is honestly, for me, it's a really easy listen. She has very similar humor to me. So I find her freaking hilarious. I I think she's like comedy half the time, but she's actually like really helped me, even though I don't talk to her every single day because she lives in England, but I still get to like listen to the podcast and I learn a lot from her. Um, That's one particular book that I couldn't, I could, I recommend it to people that aren't even interested in starting a business, but it's really well written. And she goes into a lot of like productivity and things like that. I've actually recently got into Blue Ocean Strategy. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I listened to a podcast about it and it's so interesting. I'm kind of wanting to learn more and more about obviously like get, launching businesses and kind of like doing like sweat equity deals and kind of like getting more into like launching businesses to new markets and everything like that. So Blue Ocean Strategy podcasts are probably a little bit easier to listen to than reading the book because yeah, it's yeah, really yeah, dry. Um, but then also Grit. Have you read Grit? Grit? Uh, no, I've been recommended it by a couple of people and yeah. I've seen it pop up, but I'm, I'm yet to read it. Yeah. So Grit's a hard, it's a slow burn when it comes to reading it, but there's definitely parts that I've stuck with it. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's pretty much like why some people make it and why others don't all comes down to the mindset of like getting through the harder times. And I always think about it though, it's like, I've got to where I am with three years of running three and a bit years of running the business and the hardest days are still yet to come. So I'm almost like grit actually prepares me for those things Mm. because some of the scenarios I'm like, Oh my God, someone got through that. Fuck. Like, so yeah. And I'm sure you've had those two. hundred percent. Those are three really good examples. And like grit, like sometimes like the best business books, if they're, if they're not like the, the, the reason, like I found the writing style over the last like five years has got really easy to read. Like Grace's book, I'm sure I haven't read mm. it, but like Stephen Bartlett's book, like yep. the style now, if it's a new book, it's really easy to read. Did he some, bring out a book? Is that right? Um, it's was uh, it recently? a happy, sexy millionaire. Oh, uh, three years ago. Oh, what? I thought Stephen. it was a new thing. He's got another book. Oh, okay. He's got okay, another right, new right, book right. as well. Yeah. Yeah. But like, they're really easy to consume, but some of the best like business concepts, of the older books are a little bit dry and harder to get mm. through. But if you can like even just use the word grit to just get through a boring book, there's so much good in it. So you know what good, I mean? Yeah. And like for you, like the Grace example, what really has impressed me about her is how much she's done and, and her maturity approach towards business at such a young age. It's insane. She's a, she's a freak to be able to do that. she's a freak. Right? Like she'll just like, she has so much going on, but she still gives so much attention to like, she is so present, more present than my friends that don't have business, mm. like seven successful businesses. It's insane to me. Yeah. And she's still like, does, has a wild night has out. Like and she's stuff. got a life and it's just like, it baffles me. And I think there's one, yeah, massive takeaway from me is that like balance is so possible if you actually just time things right. And like actually just like are organized. And I think mm. that makes like such a big difference. Yeah. And I think finding like, it doesn't even have to be a mentor as in like they're involved in your life, but finding people you look up to and aspire mm-hmm. to like, don't just do who your friends think are cool or who has the most followers. Like look at how they move, how they operate their sort of businesses, their sort of lifestyle and like follow the people that like you want a life like theirs as well, you know, yeah. find the right people. And then 
it's the same thing. You'll be attracted like once you start surrounding yourself with the people living the type of Average life you of want. People. Exactly. And mm. it can be as well, the people you follow and, and watch online, if they're doing positive things and, and, and inspiring you in good ways rather than making you insecure or making mm. you doubt yourself, that is also a way that you can surround yourself with people as well because not everyone yeah. has the access right at the beginning. No. So like find those people online and that can have a really extreme, like Gary yeah. V was a massive yeah. impact on my oh, life. Good, and yeah. Working with him, you know, flying around the world, doing stuff with him absolutely changed my perspective and yeah. everything. And like, because it's lonely if you It's don't. lonely, yeah. right? And like, even at the beginning, just getting some sort of direction to follow, it can be really powerful because it's the hardest at the start when you don't know what to do or what to do next. Mm. Um, but last question, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Do you have like, any words of encouragement or words of advice for any any young entrepreneur, any young person, early 20s, late teens, thinking of getting into business? Okay, I kind of knew you were going to ask this question. So the fact that I didn't prepare for this sucks. <laughs> but okay, so I kind of already, I did give it a little bit earlier just in the episode about how I think working for someone is really, really mm-hmm. important. I think that as you're developing your skills and you wanting to go into business, I think that my biggest piece of advice would actually be to slow down and to, whilst it's like really exciting to launch, also understand that people share the highlights of everything. I'm guilty of it when I'm like crying because I'm so overwhelmed. I'm not talking about the times that a client's like yelled words at me that they'll never be able to unhear. So I think it is really important to remember that they're most of the people are really only showing the highlight reels, just like influences and everything like that. So slow down, learn from someone else, really think about what your, I guess, position is in the business world. Like if you're bringing out a company or a service, make sure that that points of those points of difference have really been thought about and also understand that it is going to be hard and that there are going to be hard days because not everyone shows them. I think we're really moving that like you and I and like other business owners as well are being so much more open about how much it can suck, but I still Mm -hmm. maybe not as detailed as like, because we can't talk about money. We can't talk about numbers and we can't talk about the really shit things because it might be like legally like you're not able to, but I think my biggest piece of advice is just to slow down, think things through, but also be aware that it's not going to be as easy as what people, I guess, make it seem like it will. I always talk about like the Kylie lip kit launch. People always think it's going to be the Kylie lip kit launch and it just <laughs> never is. Well, they probably don't have a hundred million followers. Exactly, exactly. For someone that didn't prepare, I think you nailed that. Oh, good. Uh, I was like, oh, what so, did I just say? Good job. So for anyone listening that doesn't already know who you are, where to find you, where's the best place people can find what you're doing yeah. or be seen, like where's the best place? So be seen socials is the Instagram account. That was like the old account, but now I don't have time to go into that. But Lexi Murray is the personal account. So I am trying to move into like doing more businessy related stuff. So I'll probably post some podcast episode, like clips from this too. Um, and then yeah, be seen socials is I love it. It'll be out soon so everyone will see all the content in like a week's time. So not a long wait. There we go. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor. Do me a favor. Do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.